Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Savior Jesus to worship here at Living Shepherd. It's a joy to gather together with you this morning as we continue to look at our God's grace, our God's promises that, that comfort and sustain us throughout our lives. You know that we've been on a sermon series these last couple weeks called Church Pictures. These pictures that Jesus gives us of what the church should look like, what the church should do, what the church is built on, what the members of the church have. Today we're going to be talking about how the church carries keys. And that might seem confusing at first, but Jesus makes it clear in our gospel reading this morning. So we'll talk about what it means that the church carries keys and that you get to live in the forgiveness of Christ. And then you get to reach out with that forgiveness as well. May God bless your worship this morning, today, and every day. And we welcome all those who are joining us online this morning. It is a joy for us to gather together with you, even if you can't be here in person with us. If you are watching online, we'd love it if you would leave a comment for us. Let us know that you're watching, even if it's just to say your name, so that we know who's worshiping with us and so we know how we can serve you better. If you're looking for our worship folder, you can find that on our church website, livingshepherd.com. If you go to the Alive and Growing tab, there will be a heading there for worship, and you can download our worship folder there. We'll begin this morning with our opening hymn, hymn 532, verses 1 through 3. God is here as we his people, hymn 532. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful 
and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us praise the Lord with hymn 394, Blessed are the saints of God. Let us pray. O Lord, let your continual mercy cleanse and defend your church. Protect and govern it always with your goodness, so that by your help it, remains, it may remain steady and safe always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. Here God tells Ezekiel who he is, actually, for the people of Israel. God calls him a watchman. He, he's someone who, who goes out and has to watch and make sure that no danger approaches the people of Israel. This was a prophet's job, to speak God's word, to protect them from danger. The people of Israel sometimes heard Ezekiel's words and said, boy, this guy is mean and cruel. But God reminds us that this was his love in action. He was protecting his people from sin, from danger. And God calls us to do the same thing with each other, to protect each other from the dangers of sin and to call out to each other. Our first reading from Ezekiel 33. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked man will die for his sins, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin. But you will have saved yourself. Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? 
This is the word of our God. Our psalm of the day is actually printed for you on page 14. It's a new hymn um, that Sarah has, has written. I don't think we've sung it before. So uh, we'll have a soloist sing the first verse of this hymn for you so you can understand how the melody goes, and then you're invited to join in on verses 2 and 3. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. So if we understand that our responsibility and our role as Christians is to look out for each other and to care for each other, Paul gives us a wonderful example of how he did that personally. And we understand that this this is not a personal attack or a personal accusation against someone. Rather, it all comes back to the comfort and the peace of forgiveness. Right? And you'll notice as Paul details this account of how he had to call Peter out on his sin, it all comes back to justification. When you, in love and in patience, call each other out on sin and hold out the forgiveness of Christ for each other, you are keeping that Bible's central truth at heart. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force, force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a, a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law 
so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is the word of our God. Our next hymn is printed for you on pages 6 and 7. It's hymn 304, Jesus Sinners Does Receive. Out of respect for the words and works of Christ, please stand for the gospel. The gospel for this Sunday and our sermon text for this morning is from Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that Every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that If two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. So these last few weeks, we've been looking at some of the pictures that Jesus uses to describe the church. And we started off with the foundation, right? The church is built, and and the church actually stands forever on the forgiveness of Christ. And then we talked a little bit about one of the unique features of each and every member of this gathering. Every person in the church bears a cross. They have the burden of battling against the sinful self in the midst of difficulty. And now we come to another picture. And this picture isn't so much about what the church is built on or about what the members of the church look like. This picture is about how the church 
functions. Specifically, how members of this church interact and deal with one another. And as we read Jesus' words here, it's going to be important for us to keep this in mind. Jesus isn't talking about how his church interacts with other people outside of the church. Look again at the first verse of our reading. If your brother sins against you. That word brother is used in a very specific way here. And, and actually, throughout the Bible, God uses the word brother and, and other words like it. Sisters, father, children, all to emphasize an important point about the church. The church is a family. It's not just some random collection of strangers who happen to get together on a Sunday morning. The people who are sitting next to you are not just others. They're family. God fully intends these relationships here to be deeper and closer and, and, and even better in a way than those relationships that you might find in an office or, or at a coffee shop or at a movie theater, right? These places where we, we, we are joined together with incidental connections because of, of shared space or shared experience. This is a family. And so maybe that's the first thing that we should reflect on this morning. Do we understand that? And do we accept that? Is this family? It's really not that unusual when you think about it to, to look at groups of gatherings in this way, right? Ask anyone who served in the military, right? What word will they most often use to describe the bond that forms between them and their fellow soldiers? Brotherhood, right? Same is true for, for police officers and firefighters. These aren't just people who happen to wear the same uniform. There's a deeper bond there. Even coworkers and and friends and students sometimes move beyond just being mere acquaintances and develop these, these bonds that, that create a community or a sisterhood or a family. And that's what God wants his church to be. A family. Because we are bound together by something deeper something better than anything else in this life. We are bound together by a Savior who gave up his life for us. That is what has made us a family. And as a family, we, we have an important responsibility to make sure that each and every one of us stays within this family. And to do that, to do that, this family sometimes has to deal with the difficult and, and ugly reality. Sin. And that might be surprising to some people, especially to people outside the church. Wait a minute, there's sin in your church? But to people who have been forgiven at the cross and who have been gathered into this family, it's not surprising at all, is it? Now, that doesn't mean that we like sin. We don't want it to cause issues and divisions, but at the same time, we understand what the church is and who the church is. The church is a gathering of sinners. And we've said this before, right? The church is not a country club for saints. It's a mass unit for sinners. And so that means that as forgiven and gathered sinners, we understand our responsibility is to handle sin correctly and, and appropriately. And Jesus lays out a roadmap for this process in our reading this morning. For when fellow family members hurt and affect each other with sin. And this, this process starts with individuals. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Did you notice what this conversation was not? 
Sorry, that's a weird question, maybe. Did you notice what it was not? This conversation is not public. For as, as difficult and as painful and even as personal as the sin that sometimes get between, gets between individuals, it stays between individuals. There, there is no separate conversation saying, did you hear? Can you believe what he did? You see what she's doing? That's not what this church does. And notice, too, that this conversation is not meant to be humiliating or contentious. It, it is simple and it is straightforward. There is no, all right, I'm about to go tell Bill what an obnoxious jerk he is and how I can't believe that he would ever do that to me. No, that's not what this family does. Now, that doesn't mean that talking about sin with another individual is easy. That doesn't mean that it won't, at times, be awkward and uncomfortable. And neither does it mean that Jesus will always give you the exact right words to say so that the sin will be handled and there will be no more issues. No, but, but there is an undercurrent of love that flows through this entire process. And it starts right here. Love starts when individuals go talk to each other. When sin comes between them. Love is straightforward and clear and honest. But love also listens. Love has the expressed hope, the expressed desire of being able to share the forgiveness of Christ. Right? And so what happens when this love is put into practice? Forgiveness. And, and this family then remains together. You have won your brother over. But the process continues. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So maybe it's good for us to point out another facet of this love. Love doesn't just stop with just one mention, with just one conversation, with just one opportunity. And Jesus actually addresses this in the, in the verses that immediately follow. They're not printed for you in the worship folder, but maybe you remember this story, right? After Jesus says this, Peter thinks about it, and he comes to Jesus and, and asks him, well, how many times do I really need to forgive my brother?" Even up to seven times, he asks. And do you remember Jesus' answer? I tell you, not seven, but 70 times seven. Love doesn't stop. Love doesn't just mention sin in passing and then walk away and think, well, that problem will take care of itself. Love doesn't leave someone in continued spiritual danger without continuing to warn them. Love doesn't say, well, he had a chance. Guess we're done here. Love doesn't say, well, I talked to her once, but she disagreed with me, so I guess there's nothing else I can do. No, that's not how this family works. And in fact, when sin between individuals gets to the point where those individuals can't talk about it anymore, that's when other family members are brought into this loving process. And did you notice the protection that Jesus gives in this process? So for the person who, who needs to be called out on their sin, who is stuck in sin, there's this protection. They, they can know for sure that there's more than one person who loves them and cares for them and wants to warn them and prevent them from danger. And they're also protected from being an unfair or unjust target of someone else's personal vendetta because two or three others are right there making sure that doesn't happen. And then for the person who has the difficult and painful and, and maybe even sometimes uncomfortable task of pointing out someone else's sin, they're also protected. 
protected from any sort of blinding selfishness, right, that, w- that would keep them from talking about a serious matter or that would, that would make them talk about it arrogantly, right, because their fellow family members are right there with them, making sure that doesn't happen, making sure they're talking honestly and lovingly with one another. The process continues. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And then there's this, right? After sin has been lovingly addressed between individuals, after other family members have brought in to share the same loving concern, then the whole family gets involved in this loving process. And we wish that this process always worked smoothly, right? That there were never any hiccups, that that we would never even get to this point. But the reality is that sin sometimes takes a strong hold on people, even in the church. And the devil works overtime in the church, in this family, to try and tear people apart. And so sometimes this family has to make one last desperate attempt to keep their family together. This isn't punishment. This is a call. This is a prayer that no one would ever want to leave the beauty and the safety of this family. And to make that call and that prayer very personal, sometimes the church has to separate itself from sins and and lovingly plead out to continued sinners, look at all that you're missing out on. And the hope in all of it, the hope is that this family member would be restored and that the family would stay together. This is the process that Jesus gives to his family, to the church. And so maybe here at the end of this process, it's good for us, each and every one of us, to ask an important question. Where am I? Where am I in these verses? See, it's it's a mistake to think that you and I will only be the ones who are carrying out this process, following these steps according to Jesus' instructions. Because again, if I understand who the church is, it's this gathering of sinners, I will also understand that I am sometimes going to be on the other side of that process. Jesus says, wherever two or three gather in his name, there he is with them, right? God has gathered his church. We are gathered in his name and Jesus is right there with us. And that means he is right there with me even when I need to be called out for my sin. This is God's love for me. This is Jesus' love for me. This whole process. And that's already been spelled out so clearly in what Jesus did to make me a part of this family in the first place, right? He lived perfectly because I didn't and because I I don't. He suffered for me because I couldn't and, and I wouldn't. This is Jesus' love for me at the cross. This is Jesus' love for me in baptism where he washes away my sins. This is Jesus' love for me in Lord's Supper where I get to eat and taste and know his forgiveness. And this is Jesus' love for me, too, in a family, a family that runs after me and calls out to me and warns me of the danger of my sin. Here I am. Here you are. Here we all are. We are God's church. We are God's family. And we all are sinners who sometimes need to be called back from the brink. And maybe that leaves us with with one more question that's rolling around in your heads this morning. Why in the world is the theme for this sermon carrying keys? We haven't talked about keys at all, have we? 
Well, here's a story for you. For a good chunk of my life, I was a janitor at a high school. It was a good job. I, I really liked it. But the best part of that job, and this probably tells you more than you ever want to know about me, the best part of that job was that they gave me one of those retractable little key holder things. Oh, I love that, right? I had those keys right here. So I could unlock and lock any door in, in a school where there was a, a lot of doors, right? I could get into any room, any place with those keys. They were right at hand. They were right here. Right? It was astounding to me that they trusted me with a set of keys, but boy, that was fun, right? You are God's church. We are God's church. You have been gathered in God's name. You're built on the forgiveness of Christ, right? You stand forever on that rock, that foundation. And you've also been entrusted with a set of keys. The keys that that open and close the door to heaven. And those keys are going to be right at hand, right beside you, anytime you need to reach out and point out someone else's sin, right? And hold out the forgiveness of Christ to them. And those keys are going to be right at hand when the same thing needs to be done to you. When someone has to call you out on sin. And when they have to hold out the forgiveness of Christ to you. This whole process that Jesus has laid out these are the keys that the church has. These are the tools that the church carries with it. And so as you go and hold out this forgiveness, as you carry these keys, you also take your Savior's promises with you. And there's a good reason Jesus followed up these instructions with his promises. He promises that he will be with you always guiding and directing your life in this church, in this family. He promises that he hears your prayers and that he answers your prayers, especially when you have to carry out this process, when you have to use these keys. And he promises he always works for the eternal good of your family. And then he promises, too, that this forgiveness that you hold out to others, it's real. And it's backed by the power of heaven so that when you say to someone, your fellow family member, you are forgiven, it's true and solid and certain. These are your keys. May God bless you as you carry these keys in his name and to his glory. Amen. Please stand. Now to him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's now join to confess our Christian faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
At this time, we will gather our thank offering. We're not able to pass an offering plate during these times, but the plate is in the back on the small table. At any time you're so moved to give an offering, you may drop it in the plate back there. If you're a guest or visitor with us, either in person or online this morning, please know that you are not obligated to give. This is one of the ways that we take this good news of Jesus out into our community, and we're so thankful that you're here to share that with us. If you're joining us online this morning during this time of reflection for the offering, it would be a great opportunity for you to connect with our congregation. Like us on Facebook, follow us so you receive regular updates about our ministry. You can also sign up for regular daily or weekly emails on our church website. Please stand for prayer. At the place for special prayers this morning, we'll include a number of our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially those who are struggling with illness, with loneliness, with discouragement. We'll ask the Lord to bless them and comfort them. Uh, We'll also give thanks to our gracious God that he blessed Kaylee Ogle with the gift of a healthy baby girl, uh, Paisley Sue, I believe her name is. Uh, So we'll thank God for that wonderful gift. And we'll also keep... Tom's brother, Scott, and also Tom's son, Sean, our member, who are both fighting the fire up by uh, Rob Roy Reservoir. We'll ask the Lord to bless and protect them. We pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us life and breath, talent and energy. And we thank you for all the other blessings and gifts you pour into our lives for protection, income, nourishment, and family. We ask your blessing on all we have and do. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you became one of us and made us God's dear children through your perfect life and death. Through you, we have forgiveness, peace, and eternal life in heaven. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have brought us to faith and that you daily reassure us with your gracious promises. Continue to work in our hearts through your word and sacrament so that we are daily strengthened to live a new life of thanks to you. Heavenly Father, you remind us of your ultimate power and your gracious love in all things. We pray especially today for all those who are struggling with personal difficulties, who are facing challenges in their relationships, and who continue to battle health and sickness. Be with all your people, Lord. Assure them that they remain in your gracious care. Comfort them with your forgiveness. Use your grace to lead them to fight against temptation and to live in selfless love for others. Remind them that not even health difficulties can rob them of the certainty of their heavenly home. And finally, Lord, use all of us to pray for and support each other during these difficulties. Teach us the right words to say and give us the right actions to reflect your love. 
Gracious God, you tell us in your word that children are a wonderful blessing from you. We thank you for keeping Kaylee Ogle safe this last week as she gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Continue to be with both Kaylee and her infant daughter, as well as the entire Ogle family. Bless them all with health, rest, wisdom, and love. And use this as a wonderful opportunity to drive them deeper into your promises and to strengthen them in your word. Almighty God, we place before you all the wildfires that are raging in our country right now and all those working to fight to contain them. Bless our brother Sean and Scott as they work on the front lines of the fire near Rob Roy Reservoir. Keep them and all your people safe. Bless their efforts and allow these fires to be contained and put out. Help us in all things to trust your gracious care and to rest in your eternal and unshakable promises. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Triune God, open our eyes to see your blessings every day. Savior of all, hear our prayer and help us in our mission. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Our worship continues with the preparation for Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. We give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise and bless your holy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world.
God tells us in his word that when we receive Lord's Supper, we are receiving bread and wine as well as the body and blood of our Savior Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. God also tells us in his word that when we commune together, we are in fact confessing agreement in teachings with those with whom we commune. For this reason, we kindly ask guests and visitors, if you are not a member of our church or a member of a church in fellowship with our church, would refrain from taking Lord's Supper at this time until we've had the opportunity to talk more about what God says about this blessed sacrament. This will also help you to not be put in the uncomfortable position of saying you agree with our church's teachings without first knowing what our church teaches. We will practice continual distribution again this morning, so you are invited to come forward from the center aisle. You're invited to come together as a family to receive Lord's Supper. And please do not feel obligated to stay up here at the table. I will continue to repeat the words of distribution throughout. So you may grab the bread and the wine and then cycle back through the outside to your seats. Come, for all things are now ready. Receive with believing hearts now the blessing of your Lord. This true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Our service now continues with the prayer that's printed for you at the top of page 12. Please stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.